Okay, so we were... Maharaj, we are at the last slide where you have given us uh, one assignment, mood and vision questionnaire. Right. I'm just going to come to it. Okay, here we go. Did you get the right paragraph? Third paragraph of the purport of verse number 14. Yeah? Yes, Maharaj. This is the one, yeah. Okay, so how did this passage relate to Srila Prabhupada? Did you think it was pretty good? It was very direct, wasn't it? Yes, Maharaj. Yes, Maharaj. Yeah, I think what else can we say, you know, it was direct. What happened? Okay. So what features of his life demonstrated this? Have you got a list? Did you? Let's hear one. Give one. Give a feature from Prabhupada's life which demonstrated this. Prabhupada left. Vrindavan at the age of 70 to come to America to establish all the temples and Krishna consciousness across the world. So that is, uh, that is one feature where he wanted to have the Vrindavan mood everywhere. One, Asritya. Okay, yeah, Prabhupada did. He went to the West to try to establish temples and to give people some Krishna consciousness. Uh, sincerity towards his uh, 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 Guru Maharaj uh, direction, that is Bhakti Siddhan Saraswati Prabhupada Maharaj directions and his wishes to uh, spread the Krishna consciousness in the Western world. So that was a commitment towards his own Guru Maharaj. Uh -huh. And also recently I heard one pastime of Srila Prabhupada. Uh, uh, this happened in the Western world when Srila Prabhupada was in the airport. You know, he was able to take the flight and he was in the airport launch and several devotees and guests came to visit Srila Prabhupada in the airport and different disciples, different guests offered different items to Prabhupada. Like somebody got flowers, somebody got incense, someone got a, a flower bouquet and some fruits. So Prabhupada immediately took the picture of Krishna. He put the uh, picture on the table and uh, he offered, you know, he offered the garland and flowers to Krishna right there. And he, uh, he lighted an instance, uh, uh, incense and uh, uh, he did the kirtan right there. He, he converted, he transformed the area within few minutes into a temple. So time and place, time place doesn't really matter for a pure devotee to establish the consciousness wherever he is. Oh, very nice. Yeah, that's a very nice example. Which, where was that? Which place did that happen? Uh, I don't know the exact place, Maharaj. Recently, Jayadvita Maharaj shared that pastime. I, I don't remember the place, though, but it was in one airport. One airport so. Okay. Interesting. Yeah, I never heard that before. Uh, Maharaj, uh, Srila Prabhupada, but always carries Krishna with him always and then if you want to give Krishna conscious all over the world in each and every look and corner you want to give the uh, Krishna conscious all over the world to deliver all the people fallen souls you say he always carried Krishna with him how did he carry him in what form he carried uh, Srimad Bhagavatam with him and then he uh, Yes, he carried his books with him because he has to do his writing. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes, what happened? Uh, 
Yes, he carried his books with him. It has to do with translation work. And so he had his commentaries of the Acharyas, different books, you know, certain books Prabhupada always carried with him with the commentary. There's one big Sanskrit book which has like four or five different Acharyas giving the commentaries on the Bhagavatam. So he carried that kind of book with him. Yeah. And, uh, and Srila Prabhupada, when he came to Ohio State University in 1969, when he came to Ohio State University, he, he did a program in one of the auditoriums in the university. More than 2,000 students attended, attended that program. Then Prabhupada did the Kirtan. So entire hall, all the students were jumping in ecstasy. They were, everybody was chanting the, you know, chanting the holy names and they were dancing. So he, he transformed that atmosphere very quickly by his chanting and Krishna Kappa. Yes, so right. Prabhupada yeah. transformed like that. Yes. I, I was reading, let me read again the passage to you. The special qualification of the pure devotee is that he is always thinking of Krishna without deviation and without considering the time or place. There should be no impediments. He should be able to carry out his service anywhere and at any time. Some say that the devotees should remain in holy places like Vrindavan or some holy town where the Lord lived, but a pure devotee can live anywhere and, can, and create the atmosphere of Vrindavan by his devotional service. It was Sri Advaita who told Lord Chaitanya, wherever you are, O Lord, there is Vrindavan. So the thing which came to me when I read this over, I thought, well, it's certainly true that uh, wherever Prabhupada was, he had the same program. It, it didn't vary, you know, but if he was in Calcutta or Mayapur, Vrindavan or New York or London, wherever he was, you know, Prabhupada's program was it was the same, you know, he'd wake up in the middle of the night, middle of the night, do writing. And I would see him also, I saw him take his uh, massage in the daytime, you know, he'd put on his gumsha and, and, and like in New York, in Brooklyn, where we had a center, he'd go out in the back garden and have his massage there. Or in Calcutta on the veranda, he'd have his massage out there on the veranda. He, he didn't, you know, it was the same program every, everywhere, you know, writing and translating and then answering mail from devotees and, and then also giving classes and morning walk also, that was another part of Prabhupada's program. He would go for a walk and he would always come back in time for the deity greeting. Some, he would do like in, in Juhu, he'd walk on the beach there, but he'd always come back in time for the deity greeting. And he, he would also like to go in, in London, they'd do the same thing, go for a walk, come back for the deity greeting, then Guru Puja, class, like that. So he, he wasn't thinking, oh, I'm in this place, now I have to do something different. Oh, it was the same program everywhere. So that's the nature of the pure devotee. There's no impediments to his service to Krishna. It was all service to Krishna. That was what, something I got from it. Anybody else like to add anything? Hare Krishna, that's one more point. Yeah, while Srila Prabhupada was traveling on the third class in train, Every rush, uh, he was sitting and writing for the magazines and the fact reported uh, information. So he was thinking, after writing, he was just on the night, uh, sitting on a third class train with heavy rush, but in between he was writing the magazines content. So that shows that the place is not the important thing, the service, that, uh, the determination that we should have. Uh, because he strived so much for. Uh, making all the souls to be and uh, happy, so, but still uh, many are in the position of the peace. Okay, thank you Prabhu. And also Maharaj, you know, there is a video on the YouTube where Prabhupada was speaking Srimad Bhagavatam on his last moment, you know, before leaving the body, 
he was still speaking bhagavatam he was still translating bhagavatam for his disciples in the hall of his room yes so that shows that there is no impediment for you know uh, for, for a few devotees mm, yes <laughs> it's very nice yes so these are some features of Prabhupada's life not disturbed by different situations his program is the same service to krishna let's go on to number three did you come up do you have a few words which uh, you feel best describe the ideal temple in terms of the mood and atmosphere what what would be a few words what 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 do you like to see in a temple in terms of the mood and atmosphere let's hear from the Madhijis. First, some Madhijis would like to contribute here. Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Sri Prabhupada, all glories to you, Guru Maharaj. Uh, one word I would like to see is cooperation. Okay. Cooperation between the devotees, working together. Yes, yes, yes Guru Maharaj. Okay, thank you. Another Madhijis? Hare Krishna Maharaj, uh, I would say that uh, the temple uh, serves as knowledge provider. A knowledge provider? Okay. Yes. People, people can come there with their problems or with their questions and somebody will be there to help them, to give the answers. Okay, very interesting. Yes, somebody else? We'll open it to Hare them. Krishna. Yes, Maharaji, yes. Maharaja, love. Love. Okay, you like to see a loving mood there between the devotees. Yes. Yes, yes it, the, the, the mood of love, the, the working together, helping each other. I was thinking more, you know, I was thinking more like enthusiasm. The, we want to see the devotees are eager to hear, are eager to serve, that eagerness. What about the Prabhus? Hare Krishna. Yes, Maharaji. Uh, yes, go ahead, Maharaji. I just thought maybe not so much in terms of devotees, but uh, newcomers, that it should be accommodative so that they don't think that a temple environment is for a certain class of people or a certain race or a certain gender. Everyone who is seeking Krishna uh, is welcome. So my word that I thought of was accommodative. Yes, that's a nice point. The importance of uh, maybe you could say reception of guests. Is it like that, you mean? Yes, yes, Maharaj. I know His Holiness Radhanath Maharaj always likes to see that. He's very particular about that in his temples. He likes to see that there's a reception there, people coming, they're received, somebody's there to greet them and to take care of them. It's it's easier done in some temples than in others. You know, places like Mayapur or Vrindavan, where you have a long, where you have a lot of people coming and going all the time, it's a bit more difficult. But, you know, a smaller, more compact temple, maybe with a closed door and so on like that. <laughs> you know, like in the, in, the, in the cities, you know, you can't just... Uh, you don't have such open temples, so you can receive people better. But in in the dams, it's a bit more difficult. Still, I, I do see the devotees doing quite well, you know. I know here in Mayapur, we used to have a devotee, every day he would sit, and he would, every day they would have people sit there, and they would give classes in the Bengali language, and then they would teach Japa and every morning after Mongol Arti in Mayapur, you know, every morning after Mongol Arti, we get people to chant. Oh, because so many people come for Mongol Arti, 
and we give the beads, get them to sit down and give them beads and get them to chant. And they chant one round. And it's very nice, very nice experience for people. So these are good things to do. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes, Prabhu. So all the temple as such this all this navida bhakti is going on and there is always a brahmachari ashram but Prabhupada all, all also wanted that since 99 percent of the devotees are garhas so there is a place where from the garhas if somebody has gone into a garhas so there has to be mandir we create a place for one cross because now there is no more uh, one is there forest is no more there so temple will be creating the moving this uh, uh, people from garhas to one cross where one can stay in the dam and uh, surrender to krishna and get involved in uh, deity service i i'm not familiar with this word what do you think daras Uh, the Varna Ashram system, uh, uh, we have uh, uh, four Varnas and four Ashram. So, out of four Ashram, uh, 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 there are Brahmacharya and then Garhas. So, one is getting into household life, then after that, one has to, after crossing 50, one has to renunciate and go and stay at the uh, uh, religious place. So, that is what Prabhupada has, uh, was always emphasizing that. All the temples we will create a place where people who has got into the household uh, uh, fold of life they can move on to go to the second third stage that is the one pras or just living in the uh, uh, at the holy place in the temple and get involved in uh, uh, systematic religious uh, practices okay yes certainly Prabhupada writes about that in the Bhagavatam that we have temp places like Vrindavan and Mayapur, which are meant for retirement. People come, we do have a number of devotees who have retired. Like here in Mayapur, a number of people have come, they were working in the Middle East before, and they came, come here to Mayapur, taken up full-time service here in Mayapur, in the Mayapur community. And uh, in Vrindavan, I see also a number of people, elderly people, come to retire there. But not everybody can come to India and come to the Holy Dham. Other places, we should be able to encourage it also. Okay, so make facilities for the retirement. People move on from the Grihastha life into the retirement. All right, number five, what can you do to, Im number four, what can you do to improve the atmosphere of your home or temple? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes, Prabhu. Uh, uh, Prabhu always wanted that this, uh, 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 this Krishna consciousness is not a, individual affair of course one person can take the lead but in the family uh, uh, parents are there children are there so slowly we have to make the whole atmosphere krishna conscious we should uh, 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 make the uh, house as, as a temple where the deity will be there all all the practices what is going on uh, in, in the temple so we can start it and, and when we, this three, four generations of people like grandfather, uh, uh, husband, wife, their children are there and neighbors are there. So it, it, sh it should become a place of worship and, and where the Krishna is the owner of uh, uh, the home and, and basically a householder, they should lead a life as a subservient or servants of the Lord rather than householder thinking that he is the owner of uh, the, the house. So that, uh, so that is how we can uh, create a more enchanting and uh, spiritualized atmosphere which is going to affect not only the whole family but all the neighborhood and community. So, well, if you get cooperation from all the family, if they're all favorable, not every home is, you know, you don't find every home where all, everyone is uh, agreeable to this. Mm. And some things, you know, if you're going to make your home a temple, 
then you have to understand, you know, you, you don't want to be sitting there with a the television on every night, you know. So that sometimes that's a challenge for people, they get very stuck on their televisions and, and so many other things, you know, sometimes people have their pets in their home also and like that. You know, you have a temple there, you have a deity there, you know, you can't do these kind of things. You have to, you have to be clear what standards you're going to have. You know, what, it's going to be a temple, you have to make it like a temple, you know. You, you have to be careful, people shouldn't be cooking meat around the place as well. It should be sattvic. So that's a challenge sometimes. Or is somebody else like to speak anything? Maharaj, uh, we have to decorate the idol and garland and flower at his lotus feet so that those who are not interested, they will look at the Lord and be inclined to know what I am doing. Okay, yeah. Decorate the deities. Make the, the Prabhupada said temples, they should be like an, an oasis in the desert, right? The desert of the material world. When you come in the temple, you should just feel, oh, this, the atmosphere here is just so different from any other place. I can always remember when I first went to the temple, uh, that I, I was in London, and I went to the temple, and it was just amazing coming out of this, coming off the street of London into this temple and seeing the deities. It was just so wonderful. It was really a transformational experience. And there have been other temples where I also greatly appreciated the atmosphere. It was so wonderful. One temple was many years ago when I was visit when I was in Detroit. He had a very, very wonderful atmosphere in the temple. It was so nicely, so sattvic and so nice, and the devotees were also very good. One thing also very important, prasadam, you know, there should be nice prasadam. This is very important. Okay. Any other comments before we go on? Any thoughts or realizations from this exercise? Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj. Yes. Accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. All glories to you, Guru Maharaj. Actually, Guru Maharaj, when, you know, remember once, well, there was one time, only once, when Guru Maharaj visited my home in 2014. And then uh, Guru Maharaj uh, told me, why do you have so many uh, figurines and dolls? <laughs> because it was a lifetime collection. Because Guru Maharaj, I'm the only devotee at home. And then, uh, so that is why I surrounded myself with lots and lots of Lord Krishna's pastimes, so many pastimes, photos, and a lifetime collection of these, uh, uh, what you call, uh, figurines. And of course, the, 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 the main altar is separate from the figurines. I thought this atmosphere will make the members of my family inclined and favorable towards Krishna consciousness. But although my altar is very grand and looks opulent and uh, I would say beautiful and flowers and uh, once a week with the garlands and, uh, and, and all that and dainty dress change and all. But somehow or other, nobody enters my puja room, only I. There are seven people living, uh, six living in my house. My one daughter, as Guru Maharaj knows, is overseas in the U.S. Only she will enter the puja room after taking bath in the morning. She'll come and fall down and pray. Only she will accompany me to do some deity dress change. Only she, I can tell her, you know, Avanita, tomorrow I'm doing deity dress change. She wake up early and help Amma. She will do it. Nobody else in my house. So my right arm left me and went off to study. Uh, nobody sees the beauty. I have to beg every member of the family and tell them that I've done a deity dress change. Please do come in and uh, uh, take a look. Uh, take a look at the deity. So for me, I feel like um, how best to. I couldn't. I'm not. Comp I cannot compromise on my Krishna consciousness standards. So if uh, they have been, uh, they have touched the pet 
Um, our pet is outside the house, not inside the house, but outside the house. So if they have touched the pet, I don't let them come into the dainty kitchen. If they haven't taken a bath, I don't let them come into the dainty kitchen. If they didn't brush their teeth, I don't let them come into the dainty kitchen. So like this, I've been a bit uptight over the rules. So in Guru Maharaj's question about how do you improve the atmosphere of your home or temple, so maybe only in that respect, then uh, I cannot uh, I cannot compromise on, on the standard of the, the standard I'm, I'm having in my dainty kitchen because I have I have no choice but to have uh, two kitchens in my home as Guru Maharaj also knows because I became a devotee after being a married woman and then I have four children already short of being separated from my husband so that's the reason why I need to have I uh, give them also their own space. So I have, I, I actually, I'm, I'm just like uh, something like that, uh, that, 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 that devotee in the previous class who said that I have so many problems, uh, but then uh, I, should, I have to think the problems are actually insignificant. I can relate to that person having the problem. So how to improve the atmosphere of my home or temple? Actually, I don't know, Guru Maharaj. I have no clue already. Hare Krishna, thank you so much. Hare Krishna. Okay, thank you, Sri Devi. I also don't know how to improve your home. <laughs> Hare I wish you good luck. <laughs> yeah, averse to religion, Guru Maharaj. They are not interested in anything. Yeah. Not even, not even normal Hinduism because they don't know Hinduism, so they don't know anything. Okay. No one... Okay, we got to go on. Let's read a bit more here. I hear about Srila Prabhupada. Yes, someone can read, please. For example, any my residence is that is the place of Krishna, where Krishna adventured himself, invented himself. So now I am in America, in your country, but that does not mean I am out of Vrindavan because if I think of Krishna always, it is as good as being in Vrindavan. I am in New York in this apartment, but my consciousness is there in Vrindavan. Krishna consciousness means you already live with Krishna in his spiritual planet. You simply have to wait to give up this body. Hmm. So that's Prabhupada's mood. Okay, someone read. My heart is always hungering after that Vrindavana. Prabhupada, just like at Vrindavana, at Vrindavana, that is practical. Now here I am sitting, New York, a very great, the world's greatest city, so magnificent city, but my heart is always hankering after that Vrindavana woman. Yes, Prabhupada, yes. I am not happy here, woman. Yes, I know. <laughs> the woman said, yes, I know. <laughs> um, Prabhupada's not thinking of his own happiness. He didn't go to the West just to... Oh, Chris, can you still hear me? Yes. Yeah, we, we just have a power cut here, so... No. So Prabhupada went to America. He didn't go there just to have a look at the place or just to sightsee. You know, he had his mission, he had it. What he wanted to do there was very clear. And as he says, you know, I'm always hankering after Vrindavan. So that is the mood of the Raganuga Bhakta, right? This is Raganuga Bhakti, or you could call it spontaneous devotion. Prabhupada was not so much worried about the rules and regulations because he was always in Vrindavan. He was always thinking of Krishna. So that's more important. Did someone read this one? Hare Krishna. Prabhupada, I shall be very happy to return to my Vrindavan, that sacred place. But when, but then, why you are? Now, because it is my duty, I have brought some message for you people. Because I am ordered by superior, my spiritual master, that whatever you have learned, you should go to the western countries and you must distribute this knowledge. So, in spite of all my difficulties, all my inconveniences, I am here because I am in duty. I, I, that is my personal convenience. If I go and sit down at Vrindavana, I shall be very comfortable there. 
and I will be. I will have no anxiety, nothing of the sort, you see, but I have taken all the risk in the old age because I am in duty bound. I am in duty bound, so I have to execute my duty in spite of all my inconveniences. That is the idea. Bhagavad Gita 2.11, New York, March 4, 1966. Thank you, Prabhu. So 1966, Prabhupada just come there, He's still in New York. And he's describing his thinking that he came under the order of a spiritual master. That, that his, he had his duty to perform. So he said, I'm duty bound. I have to execute my duty. So this was his thinking and doing everything actually. You can see. Uh, printing the books, if you ever get money, his spiritual master told him, then you use the money to print books. So when people would come to Prabhupada and say, I have some money I want to give you, he said, put it in my book fund. And so his, the money, donations would go like that into Prabhupada's book fund, he would use it for printing books. Okay, so this has been dis we're just this is the section here in the eighth chapter describing ananya bhakti or undeviating pure devotional service, right? And now Krishna goes on. Lord Krishna goes on to describe about the difference between the material and the spiritual world. Uh, this comes in the next section mm. that's going to be 14, 14 and 15 text number 15 will also be is also pure devotion this is a, another well-known verse often quoted that those great souls who are yogis in devotion they never return to this material world why? Because they know it to be a temporary place of misery. Dukalayam ashaswatam, right? That's text number 15. Dukalayam ashaswatam. Mamu pecha punarjanma dukalayam ashaswatam. So they, they don't come back to this material world. But that's for the great souls. Great souls meaning yogis in devotion. So they've understood the nature of the material world, miserable. We're not always so convinced that the material world is miserable and we often forget that. So anyway, Lord Krishna is describing this, the, the, the mood of the pure devotees, that they want to go back to Godhead, to the spiritual world. and then. Text number 16, Lord Krishna introduces the nature of the material world, a bit more about the nature of the material world. And he, he describes that the whole material world is miserable. Text number 16, from the highest, the planet of Lord Brahma, down to the lowest, all are places of birth and death, places of misery, repeated birth and death, misery. But the difference is, if we can go to Krishna's abode, we never take birth again. So we can see Lord Krishna uh, here contrasting the material world and the spiritual world. And we should learn from the purport that all the other yogis, they, they cannot go to Krishna's abode. They have to come back to the material world. The karma yogis, and the hatha yogis, the jnana yogis, if they want to go to Krishna's abode, they have to become bhakti yogis. It's only the devotees who can go into Krishna's abode. 
these other people, they may be yogis, but they, they can't get to go into Krishna's abode. So they, they can go up to the higher planets, they can enjoy, and then they come back. So even Lord Brahma, he has to worry also about old age and death. Even you get all the way up there to Brahma Loka, the topmost planet in the universe, it's also subject to annihilation. And then Lord Krishna gives details about the duration of time in the material world, the nature of Brahma's day, Sahasra Yuga Paryantam Aharyam Brahmano Vidu, that one day of Brahma's time is a thousand ages. So you, you get all the way up to Brahma's, Brahma Loka, you have a long time to wait before you can go back to Godhead. Because you have to wait for the end of Brahma's life. It's, it's only at the end of Brahma's life when Brahma is going to go back to Godhead. So you have to wait for that time when the Brahma Loka is going to be dissolved. And it's going to come at the end of Brahma's life. But one day of Brahma's life is a thousand ages. One thousand cycles of the four yugas. So that's one day and Brahma lives for 100 years. In every year there are 12 months and every month 30 days and every day, after every day there's a night. And the night is the same length of time as the day. So just imagine the duration of time in the material world. This is pointed out to us. We should understand so much time in the material world. But all of that time is actually, how does it compare to the spiritual world? This time of the, the life of Brahma is just one breath of Mahavishnu. Mahavishnu breathes out all the universes come out. And then Mahavishnu inhales and everything, it's all over. The whole lifespan of Brahma, the whole creation, everything, it's all finished. So Lord Krishna is describing the material world there and then he goes on to describe the spiritual world. In the Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna also talks about the, the spiritual world. comes up in text number uh, 20, text number 20, yeah. Text number 20 is describing the spiritual world. So you've got a few verses on the material world and then we get some verses on the spiritual world. So you might like to take a few minutes just to jot down some uh, qualities which contrast the material and the spiritual world. Just like we can see here in text number 20, it's mentioned here that the spiritual world is transcendental. And so the material world is certainly not transcendental. Material world is under the modes of nature, but the spiritual world is transcendental. The spiritual world is never annihilated, of course. The material world is subject to destruction. Would someone else like to give some other points comparing the material and spiritual world from this section? The Krishna Maharaj so material world is the external separated potency of the Lord by 
spiritual world is the internal potency. Okay, that's good. Yes, uh, material world is the external potency. The un uh, bahir, bahir Anga Shakti and the spiritual world is the Antaranga Shakti, internal potency. Okay. In material world, Maharajji, this uh, Mahamaya uh, is the, the uh, uh, bewilders the, all the jivas, while in uh, uh, the, his, uh, the spiritual world, it is Yog Maya, which, uh, in the, he, he, as he helps in elevating this uh, spiritual consciousness. And okay, can we, hear, can we hear from someone else? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Material world is temporary, but uh, uh, spiritual world is permanent. It is free from birth and death. Yes. Yeah, we explained that. We gave that in the beginning. Oh, <clears throat> Hare Krishna Maharaj. In the material world, we find lust. In the spiritual world, we find love. Okay. Yes. Lust is there. And, and in love is. Okay, no birth, there's no old age and disease. Alright? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes? The, the spiritual world is out of our vision. Only by uh, uh, hearing about that we can understand uh, as a devotee. But the material world is uh, what we are seeing. Okay. The, the spiritual world, we could, we could say what is apricot? It's not. That is a. It is uh, only by uh, Guru's uh, uh, instructions, by following Guru's instructions, we can understand the, the <coughs> beauty of a spiritual world. And Vedas will help us to understand the spiritual world. Uh -oh. yeah. mm -hmm. yeah, we have to purify our mind and senses. We want to see the spiritual world. Of course, Lord Krishna could show the spiritual world to the people of Vrindavan. They wanted to see this. Lord Krishna showed them the vision of the spiritual world. He could give them. Of course, they were all they were all his devotees. They were the people of Vrindavan. They were Brajbasi people, so they were all pure devotees. And Lord Krishna showed them the spiritual world. He gave them the opportunity to see. All right. Yes, someone else like to offer something else? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes, uh, In material world, sorry, in spiritual world, like our only concentration and our only aim is to serve Lord Krishna. And even uh, we don't have any envy against other devotees there. But in material world, we see only envy. And our aim is only for our material activities. Okay. Yes. And, uh, we go back and we need not to come back down to this material uh, world. But in material world, we'll be like cycling or going up and down. And uh, according to the modes of nature, we'll be up and come down. So the, the eternal spiritual world, we need not to come back and come back. Okay. Okay, here's here's the notes on it from this on this slide. The material worlds described in text fifteen to nineteen and the spiritual world is there in text twenty and twenty one. Material world, place of birth and death, you said. Nobody talked about how miserable it was here. <laughs> but we did hear it was under the control of time. Right, but we should know it's miserable, ignorant. You know, the, the spiritual world is eternal, blissful, and full of knowledge. So the material world is the opposite. It's not blissful. It's miserable. It's not full of knowledge. It's full of ignorance. Uh, and it's not eternal. It's temporary, of course. So the spiritual world is never annihilated. It's not under the influence of time. It is supreme, it's unmanifest, 
and infallible. No, there are many other points which we could mention, like the spiritual world is three-fourths, the material world is one-fourth, different sizes, like that. Anyway, Lord Krishna wants, he's explaining, why, why do you think he's explaining this to us? What's the purpose? Maharaj, to know that, to, to tell us that we are not meant for this material world, we are meant for spiritual world. Our main Places, uh, right. We should we should become attracted to this to the spiritual world. We should think, my goodness, the material world is so horrible. Let me get out of here. And there's one purport where Prabhupada says we should become fascinated with the thought of the spiritual world. You know, just like people become fascinated with the thought about going to another country. And they think about going to this, to the other side of the world, they think it must be so wonderful there and everything. You know, people have all these illusions. So we, we should be fascinated with the thought of going to the spiritual world. That I just want to go there and, as Prabhu said, go to Goloka Vrindavan. Or maybe you're a Vaikuntavasi, maybe you want to go to Mathura or, or Dwarka or Ayodhya, maybe you're a Rambhakta. Anyway, you should want to go there into the spiritual world, to be with Krishna and to enjoy that nice association. Okay, so that takes us up to text number 21, at uh, top to now 22. Oh, tw oh, 20, what, well, 22 is just introducing the subject and then you come to uh, 20. 24, 24. Oh, let me see. There's a nice verse. Text 21 describes very nicely about the nature of the spiritual world and Lord Krishna to attract us all. And then text 22, we hear about the personality of Godhead, greater than all, attainable by unalloyed devotion. Although he is in his abode, he is all-pervading and everything is situated within him. So, Lord Krishna is speaking this verse, actually he's describing himself. Of course, Prabhupada writes about he. So this is helping us to understand more about Krishna and we should become more and more attracted to Krishna, understanding how wonderful Lord Krishna is. And it's all the more wonderful because he's our best friend, he's the best friend of everyone. So Prabhupada gives an extensive purport there. And then in text 23, then they introduce the subject about the passing, about how we pass at different times from the world. Different people, not just devotees. First we're going to hear about others, how they pass away from the world. So the first one who is brought up in text number 24, we hear about those who know the Supreme Brahman. So, you hear the Brahman, right? You know, they're talking about the Supreme Brahman. They attain that Supreme by passing away from the world during the influence of the fiery God, in the light, at an auspicious moment of the day, during the fortnight of the waxing moon, or during the six months when the sun travels in the north. So, you can see from our notes here, this is describing, not devotees, but this is describing jnanis and how they come, how they reach to the impersonal Brahman. They go to the impersonal, but it, de it depends so much on these things, taking advantage of the auspicious points, the influence of the fiery God in the light 
auspicious moment of the day, during the fortnight of the waxing moon, during the six... They have to really be in control of when they leave the body. You can see it's really important. If they're going to get success in this, they have to really be able to control when they leave the body. Not everybody can do that. It's, you have to be really a, a great yogi to be in that, to, um, on that level that you can decide when you're going to give up the body. My grandfather Bhishma, we read in the Srimad Bhagavatam, grandfather Bhishma could do it. Of course, he had that benediction from his father that he could leave when he wanted. But we don't know, we don't know when or when we're going to have to leave the body. It's not really something which we, we, we worry about too much as devotees. We don't have to worry about it. But these yogis, they do. They really have to worry about it. They may be lucky. They may leave at the auspicious time, but they may not. You don't know. It's not every yogi has that power that they can decide when they're going to give up the body. Then te text 25 describes the mystic who passes away from the world during the smoke, the night, the fortnight of the waning moon, or the six months when the sun passes to the south. Then they reach the moon planet, but again come back. So this text is describing the karma, karma kandi, people who do the ritualistic practices for their material benefit. So they go to the moon planet and they can stay there for some time and enjoy, maybe 10,000 years they can stay there and enjoy their punya. And then they come back. They come back down again to the earth. So they don't get out of the material world. This is the karma kandi people. You can understand to their passing also depends on these different situations. They have to be able to leave at these particular times. And then, next verse, this two, oh well, that's a summary, text 26 is a summary. Two ways of passing, one in the light and one in darkness. If you leave in the light, he doesn't come back. But if one passes in darkness, he returns. So, we should understand this is not just for everyone. But this is only for great yogis. You know, some people feel, oh, my grandfather left the body during the daytime. Does it mean he's not going to come back? Well, if he's a great yogi, if he was a jnana yogi, maybe he doesn't come back. But it's not just for any ordinary karmi or a vikarmi, as most people are. They don't follow any regulative principles. And so, you know, these people, the, 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 this is being described only for great yogis. Kar, the karma yogis, the karma kandis, actually, the karma kandis. We put how karmis, meaning karma kandis, not just materialistic sense enjoyers. Not just any material. Karma kandis are sense enjoyers, but uh, not just any karmi, but karma kandis and the jnanis and the devotees, how they depart from the world, right? So the devotees, for the devotees, it's described, text 27, although the devotees know these two paths, O Arjuna, they're never bewildered. Therefore, be always fixed in devotion. So for the devotee, that's the important point, to be fixed in devotion. It doesn't matter what time you leave the body. It doesn't matter where you are or any, which direction the sun is moving or anything. 
What's important is that we're in devotion, we're thinking of Krishna, and then there's no problem. So the devotee can leave, the, we can, devotees, of course we have to be in devotion, we should be thinking of Krishna. It's important. We're not thinking of our dog, we're not thinking of our family or our car or money or anything. We're simply thinking of Krishna, that I want to go and serve Krishna, I want to go on with my service to Krishna. Right? Let's see, is there another slide here? Oh yes, yeah, somebody can read the quote, please. Krishna is here advising <coughs> Arjuna that he should not be disturbed by the different paths the soul can take when leaving this material world. A devotee of the Supreme Lord should not worry where he will depart by arrangement or by accident. The devotee should be firmly established in Krishna consciousness and chant Hare Krishna. He should know that concern over either of those two paths is troublesome. The best way to be absorbed in Krishna consciousness is to he always dovetailed in his service, and this will make one path to the spiritual kingdom safe, certain, and direct. Bhagavad Gita 8.27 Park. Okay. Prabhupada's given a nice explanation here. For the devotee, not a problem. Just be in Krishna consciousness, chant Hare Krishna, and then there's no problem. That's the fact. Okay, here's the overview of the chapter. We began with Krishna answering Arjuna's questions. And then, next section, we heard about remembering Krishna. Remember, at the time of death, antakale chamameva smaran mukva kalevara. We have to remember Krishna. So, remembering Krishna. What we remember at the time of death will determine where we go in the next life. Then we heard about yoga, mishra, bhakti, and different kinds of yogis. Some practicing celibacy, some chanting om, some meditating on the impersonal brahman, some like that. So different yogis, and they have their yoga mixed with some devotion. And then Lord Krishna described for us the pure devotees, pure devotional service. Lord Krishna said, I am easy to obtain because of his constant engagement in devotional service. And Lord Krishna also spoke about uh, fixing your mind on me to, uh, to Arjuna. He was telling Arjuna, fix your mind on me and fight. So Lord Krishna didn't encourage any of us to give up our duties or to give up our work and responsibilities. He wants Arjuna to fight, but he wants Arjuna to fight in consciousness of Krishna. So that's pure devotional service, being active in the service of Krishna. Then we heard about the material and spiritual worlds, and finally the supremacy of devotion in attaining the Supreme. That's the final section there. Here's a quote from Prabhupada. If one is fortunate enough to understand Bhagavad Gita, especially these middle six chapters in the association of devotees, then his life at once becomes glorified beyond all penances, sacrifices, charities, speculations, etc. For one can achieve all the results of these activities simply by Krishna consciousness. So this is Srila Prabhupada's teaching. You can achieve everything by Krishna consciousness. You don't have to worry about all of these other things. If you're just Krishna conscious, then everything will come. All right. Let's see. Can I ask a question? Uh, yes, please do. 
Yeah, so Maharaj, about uh, constantly thinking about Krishna. Um, Krishna suggests that you know one has to think about Krishna while doing their prescribed duties. Right? So even Arjuna was fighting in the battlefield, but he was not constantly thinking about Krishna. Because in, in, a, in, in a war, he has to think about the enemies, how to defeat the enemies, kill the enemies. So how do we understand the statement that you no know, one has to think about Krishna constantly and do their job? Because even in our day-to-day -day life, when we are working in different fields, our jobs are so demanding, we are completely absorbed in our job. So how, how to understand and practically implement that uh, uh, consciousness? Yes, you get very entangled in your jobs. You know, you see, Arjuna was, he had Krishna with him by his side. So, when there was problems, Krishna was there to help him. And he, he he's constantly, actually Krishna is, Krishna is driving the chariot, right? So he's, on, he, he's only seeing the back of Krishna. So Bhishma said he was more fortunate than Arjun, because Bhishma could see Krishna directly, he's seeing the face of Krishna. Arjuna was behind Krishna. But still, by having the, that Lord Krishna's there with him, that, you know, there's certainly going to be some consciousness of Krishna there. Because he's right, he feels he's there with him guiding him and driving his chariot, you know, he's with him. So certainly, you say he's, Arjuna wasn't Krishna conscious, he was fighting. Of course, he has to fight, he has to think what mantra to use, he do, using different mantras to fight. So, but at the same time, there's all, as soon as the mantra is released and everything, is it, again, is with Krishna. The mem remembrance of Krishna was there. Just like somebody asked Prabhupada about uh, the death of uh, Abhimanu. Now Abhimanu was killed in the battle. Now did Arjuna lament? Yes, he lamented. Yeah. He did, right, he did lament, right. And Krishna had just spoken Bhagavad Gita to him a couple of days before. But, you know, and, and, and Krishna told him about the eternal nature of the soul. So, well, it, well, why is Arjuna lamenting? So, Prabhupada explained, yes, for some time he lamented. Naturally, your son is killed, you'll lament. But, you conquer over it. He said the next day Arjuna went out there and fought and he killed that Jayadratha. He killed the people responsible. He got those people who were responsible for Abhimanu's death. So he didn't, you know, he, he lamented, but only for some time, not for long. And he went he continued to fight. And so like that. Remembrance of Krishna is, will be there, but it's not that constant thinking, chanting Hare Krishna. He has, he has to do his duty. He has to do his duty, but he's doing it because Krishna wants him to do it. It was Krishna who wanted him to fight, and that's why he's doing it. And so that duty in itself is his Krishna consciousness. He didn't want to fight. Why did he do it? Simply because Lord Krishna wants him to do it. That's why he's out there fighting. No other reason. So you can see Arjuna is certainly in a very high level of Krishna consciousness. Actually, wherever Krishna goes, Arjuna goes with him. And Krishna is speaking Bhagavad Gita. Yeah. He, Krishna picks Arjuna because he's a devotee, not just a devotee, but he's also a friend of Krishna. So naturally Arjuna is thinking of Krishna, not, not a problem. 
So you're working, you have to also work, you have to think of Krishna. How to do it? Sadhana is very important. The sadhana, just like devotees, you know, devotees were usually like for many years we were out distributing books. We would go out in the streets and distribute books or go out for preaching, making life members, different things, different services we had to do. So we have to do sadhana every day, every morning, every evening. We need sadhana. That gives us the strength, that helps us to be Krishna conscious throughout the day. If we don't have the sadhana, then it's very difficult. Then practically it's impossible. It's that sadhana which will help us to come through all the challenges to be Krishna conscious. That chanting, carefully chanting and worshipping Krishna, reading the books a bit, hearing the philosophy is very important for us. This is how we protect ourselves. Just like if you're a fireman and you have to fight the fire, you have to have special clothing. You get the you know firefighter's dress, you know, protective jacket and big helmet, big hat, and then you know they're very protected from the heat. So the same way, the devotee, we have our armor. We are protecting ourselves. By fight, by our sadhana, we every day we put on that armor by chanting Hare Krishna and by worshiping Krishna, hearing the philosophy. It gives us that spiritual strength to take us through the day, to keep us Krishna conscious. Even though you have to go in the office, you have to work with a lot of people who are not devotees, but you can do it. Just like devotees, they go out every day, they're going out every day distributing books or preaching. Like, you know, they meet so many people who are not devotees. Anyway, we, have, we, have, we have to expect that. But if we have a good sadhana, we will be Krishna conscious. We will remember Krishna. So this, that's why Prabhupada put all the elements of Panch Anga Bhakti into our morning program. You know, Panch Anga Bhakti, worshipping the deity, Sankirtan, hearing this, the philosophy, associating with devotees and being in a holy place. So the holy place is like temple, you see? In your home also you have temple, and so you, 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 you have to be, sit there, you have to be there, you have to chant, you have to worship, you have to do kirtan, like that. These elements, these elements, Panchanga Bhakti, they will help us to protect us from the material energy, so that we can always remember Krishna. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Maharaj. Okay. Any other questions there? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes Prabhu, Hare Krishna. Yeah. Uh, uh, Maharaj, in fact, uh, this, when we are uh, seeing this uh, different life of uh, uh, period of uh, uh, yoga, like uh, uh, Kali Yuga, uh, then Dwapar Yuga, and then when I was calculating back to uh, uh, this uh, uh, life of Brahma, was coming out to be when we have considered this lunar year that is um, of 360 days because normally 15, 15, 30 and 30 multiplied by 2, 12, so 360. Then exactly we have been getting this uh, 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 3, 11 trillion, 40 billion uh, years. Now on that uh, meter itself, uh, when we see the life of uh, uh, this period of uh, Swargloka, so they say that uh, uh, our six months is uh, Swarg Loka one day and another six months is one night. So that means uh, uh, one year of uh, Prithvi is uh, one day of uh, uh, Swarg Loka. So that means uh, 
if you again consider 360 days in a year, so for their solar block 100 years, it will come out to be around 36,000 uh, years. Now my question is, uh, if Swarg local life is 36,000 years, while Swarg, uh, this Satyuga life period is 100,000 years. So how, when we say that uh, Swarg local life is very, very long, so how, how we can con con uh, understand this? Because maybe somewhere I'm making error. Well, well there, there's, they don't have such a yoga in the heavenly planets. They don't have that. They don't have the Satya Yuga, Treta Yuga, Kali Yuga, like, it's only the one Yuga there. It's all like Treta Yuga there in the heavenly planets. They don't have the changes of the Yugas. So, uh, Maharaj, that means this short Yuga life period is shorter than the people who was uh, there in Satya Yuga uh, uh, on earth. Well, no, couldn't couldn't be like that. There's something wrong there. What the duration of life on the heavenly planets, you know? What, how does it on the higher planet, the heavenly planets? We have we have to understand that the demigods in the heavenly planets, their bodies are not going to be quite like the bodies which we have on the earthly planet. So, their duration of life will certainly will depend on their punya. There's different levels of demigods there in Swarkaloka. Some of the demigods, of course, are more important. We know there's 33 crore demigods. Those are some of the, those are the administrative demigods, but there's other demigods who maybe don't have such administrative duties. So some of the demigods are more, <coughs> more important than the others. You know, we see like Kuvera, Lord Shiva, you know, they, they, Lord Shiva practically, he's like God. He's God of the material world. And Kuvera, He's a demigod, but I don't know how long he lives for, but certainly have a long duration of life. The demigods, they're not getting old. They're not like us. They have they have their bodies of more subtle nature. So, how to understand their duration? You, you want to understand their duration of life. We've nev I've never heard it mentioned anywhere, but uh, the fact is that the day of Brahma right? There's a partial annihilation at the end of the day of Brahma. And at that time, Swarga Loka will be annihilated. Bu, Bu Loka, Buvar Loka and Swarga Loka. Bu, Buvar and Swarg. They're all annihilated at the end of the day of Brahma. So that is the duration of the life. One day of Brahma One day of Brahma means Sahasra Yuga, thousand ages taken together. Of course, sometimes you get demigods moving, like we hear about Yamaraj, Yamaraj got cursed. He had to come in the material world and some other demigod took his position. Well, not he's always in the material world, but he had to come take a birth on earth, become this, the Sudra. 
So the, there is some mobility, but the, the demi, we hear about different demigods. They were, there was a Vijadara, became a snake. Lord Krishna delivered them, delivered him. And there's Nalakovera and Manigriva, you know, these kind of people. And they go back to the higher planets. The, even Vijadara, the Surashan, the Vijadara, he went back to Vijadara Loka. And they remain there for the day of Brahma. At the end of the day of Brahma, there will be the annihilation. That's how it works. Yes, Mother. Okay. I wanted to show you some other PowerPoint here. Let me see if I can get it open. Are you able to see this? No, Maharaj. No. No? Okay. Let me see how to show this. Let me see. Recording in progress. Haribo.
Oh, you, you can hear me okay? Yeah? Good? Yeah. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes, Maharaj. Prabhu, you have to let me share the screen. Uh, yeah. Yes, Maharaj, can you sign that? I hope so, let's see. Can yeah, you... We got it. You got it? Yeah. Okay, so this is something on the eighth chapter I wanted to show you. A quick overview of the eighth chapter here. Okay, recap. Chapter six. One who serves and thinks of Krishna, then is the best yogi, right? He's serving and thinking of Krishna. He's the best yogi. That was chapter 6. Then chapter 7 described how to attain Krishna consciousness remembrance. How to remember Krishna constantly. Right? So that was described in the beginning of the 7th chapter. Mind attached to Krishna, practicing yoga, bhakti yoga, take shelter, become free from doubt, gain knowledge, and hear about Lord Krishna. Have you got it? Maya Satta Manapartha Yoga Myanjan Madashraya Asamshayam Samagrammam Yatajas Nasi Tach Srinu. Right? The first verse of the seventh chapter. Remember? Haribo? Okay. So then going ahead. What did the, the seventh chapter overview? We heard about, first of all, knowledge through hearing. Right? Two kinds of knowledge. Coming, as knowledge which comes from Krishna and knowledge we get by our own speculation. That's the ascending, descending, right? We prefer to hear the knowledge should come down, descending through the parampara. So hearing from Krishna and Krishna's representatives. That was the first three verses. And then we heard about understanding Krishna's energy. From verse 4 up to verse number 12, we heard about Krishna's energy we heard how Krishna is the essence of everything. Do you remember some examples? How is Krishna the essence of everything? Anyone? Yes, right. Those things, yes. Okay, very good, yes. Right? And he's the Shakti of Shakti Man. <laughs> And then we spoke about accepting or rejecting Krishna. Some people surrender and some don't, right? Who surrenders? Here we have the four kinds of people. Distressed, inquisitive, desiring wealth, seeking knowledge. And who doesn't? The foolish, lowest among mankind, the, those who are deluded, and the atheists, professed atheists, they never surrender, right? So that was up to, and then we heard the best, who is the best of all those people who surrender? Johnny. What? Why? Is he just a Jnani? Is, who constantly think about Krishna. Yes, right. He's constantly thinking about Krishna. He's actually become a devotee. He's not just a jnani who wants liberation, but he's actually become a devotee. Right. And then we heard about the demigod worship. Right. 
who, and who worships the demigods? What kind of people? Material benefits. Less intelligent. Right. Those who they, have, material benefits. they have desires, less intelligent. And what, what do they want? Temporary results. And where do they go? Planets of the demigods. Uh, that was the demigod section, and that takes us up to the last section. Who can become a devotee? Who could become a devotee? Those who have got some pious credit. Of course, you don't, we, we, we don't become a devotee just by having pious credits, but we attract the mercy of a devotee. And that is what actually makes us a devotee, the mercy of a devotee. But we attract that devotee's mercy by having some piety. And of course, we should be free from sins. A devotee shouldn't be a, he can't be a sinful, you know, a, he has to, at least if he's going to take up devotional service, he has to give up sin. We spoke about surrender, right? They, they should be, he should be a surrendered soul. So surrender means accepting whatever is favorable for devotional service and rejecting what is not favorable. That is actually surrender. So that is devotional service with determination. Right? Famous verse, text 28, Desham Twantakatam Papa. Right? So then chapter 30 concluded with this verse. Sadi but abdi daivam mam, sadi yagnam chayevadu. So then this, this you can see this leads to the questions in text number, in chapter number 8. We have the Adi Buddha and the Adi Daiva and the Adi Yagya. So Arjuna wants to understand these things. Lord Krishna has said, those in full consciousness of me, who know me, the Supreme Lord, to be the governing principle of the material manifestation. That is the Adi Buddha. Of the demigods, the Adi Yagya, and of the methods of sacrifice, Adi Yagna. Then they can understand and know me, at, even at the time of death. Right? So that's the end of chapter 7. And then chapter 8 begins, Arjuna's questions. He wants to know what are the meanings of these different words. And then the chapter goes on to speak about death. We call it the final exam. The final exam for the body, for that body, but <laughs> there was always more. And then the, after hearing about death, we'll hear about at how to attain the Supreme. And the chapter finishes with pure devotion is the best. So you can see the four sections which are made here in this, in this breakdown of the chapter. The devotee who made this slideshow, he, he made it into four sections. The first one was Arjuna's doubts, D, and then about the end of life, E, and atta attaining the Supreme, A, and then at the end we hear about pure devotion, so D. <laughs> so the, the, the uh, an acronym, for the chapter, D-E-A-D, <laughs> dead. <laughs> All right, so then Arjuna's questions. Here's Arjuna's questions. What is Brahman? Who is the Adi Atma? What is Karma? What is Adi Buddha? And what is Adi Daiva? And then some more questions. Who is Adi Yagya? How is Adi Yagya known in the body? And how do you know you? How to know you at the point of... All right. And then we get the answers. Arjuna's answers. Lord Krishna's answers, rather, to Arjuna's questions. 
So what is Brahman? The Jiva is Brahman. Krishna is the Parabrahman. And the Jiva is the Brahman. Indestructible, transcendental, separate from the material body. The Adi Atma. Who is the Adi Atma? The deity of the body, presiding deity of the body. And that is described here in this answer, described to be the external nature, or the, the eternal nature, or the impressions that accompany the jiva and give the body. Right? The swabhav. The, the, these are the impressions which accompany the jiva and the, arranges for that particular body. So our eternal nature, Prabhupada speaks about the eternal nature of the soul, to be the servant. That's our spiritual nature. But in the material world, we're not thinking like that. Material world, we're thinking we're the controller. Then number three, what is karma? Karma refers to the cre producing the next material body. Fruit of activities of the jiva that lead to transmigration from material body to another. So the karma, the activities which prepare us for another body. What is Adi Bhuta? The constant changing physical world or material body. Do you remember the changes? What are the six changes we go through? Okay, yes. Good. Number five, who is the Adi Daiva? Is it the demigods or the universal form? Yes, it's the universal form. The gigantic universal form includes all the demigods and their planets. So that is the Adi Daiva. And who is Adi Yagya? That is Paramatma, the Lord of Sacrifice, the enjoyer of all sacrifice. How is Adi Yagna known in the body? How is he known in the body? Is in the heart as the regulator. He inspires the performance of sacrifice. And how to know you at the time of death? That is the subject matter of the next section. Who attains Krishna's nature? So Lord Krishna describes who attains one who remembers Krishna alone attains my nature. And here's Maharaj Kula Shekhar and his famous verse. Every South Indian would know this verse, right? Very famous in South India, Maharaj Kula Shekhar, one of the Awars. Krishna Tvediya Padapanka Chapanjarantam Adhyaiva Me Vishatu Manasaraja Hamsa Prana Prayana Katsamaye Kapavata Pitaye Kantavaro Dhanavido Smaranam Kutaste. Right? This is the prayer, famous verse. Prabhupada sings it so nice. So, what about people who don't remember Krishna? Where do they go? Well, whatever they remember. At the time, if they think of their, their home, then they may take birth in their home again, next life. If we're attached to the home, may come back in the home. Here you see the law at the time of death. There's Bharat Maharaj, the state of mind will determine the next life. That is the rule. So we have to be very careful. Careful to think of Krishna always. Mam anusmara yudhyacha. Arjuna, you should think of me 
in the form of Krishna and carry out your duty of fighting. So this is the important point. Here's a nice presentation, text number seven. Always think of Krishna and at the same time carry out your duty. Carrying out our prescribed duty, there's Arjuna on his chariot. At the same time you can see above thinking of Krishna. So what have we got to do? We've shown here, you can see physical, intellectual, and mental, and the result. We should, important instruction to all men engaged in material activities. First of all, mental, think of me and chant Hare Krishna. And then physically, carry out your duty of fighting dedicated to me. Intellectual, mind and intelligence fixed on me. And the result? Freedom from all material contamination. How to practice? We've shown chant, constantly chant Hare Krishna and perform duties. Performing duties, devotional service through your prescribed duties. Okay, any questions on this? Here's text number six. Practice remembering during one's life, not, don't wait for the time of death. So during one's life, you can see devotees doing so many services, somebody's cooking, somebody's offering, somebody's doing the deity worship and cleaning, somebody's doing book distribution, but they're always thinking of Krishna. They're talking Krishna, the mother's talking Krishna. We were just reading today in the Chaitanya Charitamrita, they were cleaning the Gundicha temple and nobody asked anyone for anything. If, whenever they wanted something, all they would say is Krishna, Krishna. Everybody would just say Krishna, Krishna. They wouldn't say anything else. All the communication was just Krishna, the holy name. They wouldn't have any other words to say to each other. All they would say is Krishna, Krishna, and it was understood. Oh, he's telling some, oh, it's easy. Just by saying Krishna. So it's easy, yes, if you practice, right? What do you have to practice? You have to practice remembering Krishna, mind constantly engaged in remembering me. This is what we have to practice. Remembering Krishna at the time of death. Krishna consciousness means the purest of the pure. Since the devotee always remembers Krishna and Krishna is the purest. Remembering Krishna at the time of death, we will attain the supreme abode. Purify ourselves by remembering Krishna. But somebody may say, cannot remember Krishna at the, at the end of life. If we don't purify ourselves, then we won't remember Krishna at the end of life. And here, for one whose remembrance, for one for whom remembrance is not possible. It is not possible for an impure soul. Can the soul become impure? Question for anyone. Can our soul become impure? Uh, when we commit sinful activities? Uh, when it comes in contact with the material nature. Does the soul ever become impure? Yeah? Uh, yes. Yes. 
I would say it becomes covered. It doesn't actually become impure, but it becomes covered. The soul itself is always transcendental, but it becomes covered. by contact with the material energy. So, how to practice remembering Krishna? Here you can see Grandfather Bhishma on his bed of arrows. How is he remembering? Of course, Krishna has come to see him, so he's fortunate. So here are some points the devotees given us to help us practice remembering Krishna. He said, live in the mode of goodness. That's important. Try to keep yourself in the mode of goodness. Keep away from the passion and the ignorance. And then the second thing, service. Our life should be dedicated to service to Krishna. Thinking of Krishna. Then the third thing, constant and incessant chanting of the Maha Mantra. And the fourth thing, Tolerate all impedident, impedient, impediments like a tree. Tolerant like a tree, right? Trinada P Sunichina. We have to tolerate the impediments. There are going to be impediments. We can't expect there won't be problems, but we have to tolerate them and go on. Right? And then the next section, attaining the supreme. And we see different ways to attain the Supreme. There's text number nine. Remember text number nine? There were ten different items by which we could meditate on the Super Soul. Ways to remember Krishna, the Super Soul. How he's omniscient, beginningless, he's a controller, smaller than the smallest, the maintainer, inconceivable, beautiful form, luminous like the sun, transcendental to material nature. So these are different ways to remember the Super Soul, to, with a yogi who meditates on the Super Soul. And then Sat Chakra Yoga, what does he do? Well, he's got to fix the life air between the eyebrows and then with an undeviated mind, in full devotion, he has to do things like well, oh, this is at the time of death. So, at the time of death, he has to do like this. Text 11 the requirement, the result of the requirements of that Sat Chakra Yoga celibacy, knowledge of the Vedas, chanting Om, and the result, maybe you get impersonal liberation into the Brahman. So, so much endeavor, but you don't get a great result. You just get impersonal liberation. So, text 10, 11 and 12 are describing the Sat Chakra Yoga. Text 12 describes about doing prajahara, fixing the mind, and then 13 also, the destination, chanting Om. So this was all described there, Yoga Mishra Bhakti. So then Krishna went on to describe about actual, the, the best path, pure devotion. Take to the path of pure devotion, and Krishna uses the word Sulabha. Sulabha meaning? Who remembers? Tashyaham Sulabha Partha. Sulabha means? Easy. Easy. Very easy. Very easy. Krishna said, I'm easy to obtain. Why? Because of constant engagement in devotional service. And for one who always remembers me without deviation. So remembering Krishna and fully engaged in his service, then Krishna said, I'm easy, <laughs> I'm easy. So there are other paths. 
we heard tonight also earlier, we spoke about the karma yogi or the karma kandi and the jnana yogi, and the hatha yogi. Do they have bhakti? They have mi mixed bhakti. They have their, but they have their own material desires. That's the problem not pure bhakti. So, if they add some bhakti to their sadhana, then they can go to the Brahma Jyoti. But the bhakti yogi, he simply wants Krishna's service. Therefore, he can get Krishna very easily because he is niskama. Niskama meaning no material desires. And then Lord Krishna describes about the spiritual world, the pure devotees, pure bhakti. He describes the material world full of misery, the great souls never come back here. And then text 16 he describes, one who attains my abode, he never takes birth again. Here you have the material world, Prabhu, you were talking about that, Vedic time period. You can see the time period. One Mahakalpa, 311,040 trillion years. One breath of Mahavishnu. So this is one breath of Mahavishnu. All of this takes place. You have uh, the lifetime of, there's, you can see one Kalpa, the daytime of Brahma, 12 hours or 32 billion years. So this is the, the Vedic time period. Here's the material world which you can see the different levels of the planets. It's not a very clear diagram. This is only a part of it. This is the material world. So, Bhutva, Bhutva, Praliyate, it's created and annihilated again and again. Again the day comes and again the night falls. But the abode of Krishna was described Text 21 and 22, the abode of Krishna is unmanifest, infallible, one who, one who goes there never comes back. It is attainable by pure devotion. And here's the description of the supreme destination. Here's our Brahma Samhita where all of this is described. So nothing superior to the abode of the Supreme Lord. We'll just go ahead. Pure devotion is the best. Different types of death. Text 24, you go to the fire god and then from the fire god you may be passed to another demigod and then another demigod, and then this way they take you out of the universe gradually, carry you out of the universe and go to the Brahma Jyoti. This was the, the, for those who live in the light. And for those who live in the dark, they will go to the moon planet, but they again come back. So the karma yogi, the jnana yogi, the hatha yogi, they're going to come back. But the devotees, they don't have to worry about that. Then if you pass in the light, he doesn't come back. If you pass in darkness, he returns. So you have to be, these yogis, they have to be very careful. 
but devotee know two paths, not bewildered. Therefore, be always fixed in devotion. Devotees do not dwell in the other paths. And here's the final verse. If you do devotional service, then you get the results, all of these results. Simply by devotional service, he attains all these, and at the end, he reaches the supreme eternal abode. Devotee is not bereft of the results derived from other spiritual activities. You can see, study the Vedas, performing sacrifice, doing austerities, giving charity, uh, fruit of activities, pursuing philosophical studies, the path of devotion contains all of these. Everything is there. You don't lose anything. So, death is the best preparation for devotion. Doubt, the end of life, attain the supreme, and devotion. So that's a quick review of chapter 7 and chapter 8. Are there any questions? We have the slides, Maharaj. Huh? And we have the slides. It's very nicely presented. You like this? Yeah, you yes, can. Maharaj. Yes, you can have. Yeah. yeah. Yes, Maharaj, it's very nice. Please share. How how do I share it with you? This is a of course. This is not. This is PDF. Uh, if you want like this, yeah. I got this one from somebody else. How should I share it with you? You can send it to the WhatsApp group or if WhatsApp. you can send it to one of the email and we can share it. Yeah. Okay, you, you, give, me, you give me an email. Yeah, um, what, I'll give it to Annie Ruda and he'll share it with you? Oh, that would be that would be the easiest, right? Okay. Uh, Maharaj, I, I may come to see you in the MI because I have to give a book to you. Okay. I will take from you. Okay. Right. Yeah, but uh, you may need to bring. Uh, it's quite a big file. Yeah, we can convert in PDF. Okay. This is PDF. This is not slides. This is PDF. But okay, any time you come. I'm usually here. And today, Maharaj, can we have these uh, OBA questions? Yes, right. Where's my book? Hey, could you cross that up? I want you to do question number seven. That's present in your own words how Krishna Bhakti can be easily performed with reference to 926 verse and purport. So that's from the ninth chapter. Yeah. Question seven and Maharaj, we have to share two questions, no? Ah, uh, yeah, two questions. Yeah, yeah, two how, questions. yeah the, and the other one was, I thought you could do the one on the. Uh, yeah, question three about demigods. Explain in your own words the proper understanding of demigod worship with reference to. 
appropriate verses, purports and analogies from Bhagavad Gita. Mentions chapter 3, 10 to 16, chapter 7, 20 to 23, and chapter 9, 20 to 25. That's question number three about demigods. Okay, so question three and question seven. Yes, Maharaji. Is that all right? Yes, Maharaji. This is the... I'll give you time to work on them. Okay, any other questions? Okay, then we'll finish here tonight. Yes, we'll see you next week. Yes, Mother. Thank you very much. Srila Prabhupada Ki. Jai. Jai. Thank you very much, Guru Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna.